Welcome, friend. Have a seat by the fire. Make yourself comfortable. Looking through the borrowed eyeglasses of a killer, a convicted murderer, suddenly the world became clear. Among us moved dark beings, with eyes that burn wicked with the fires of hell. And most chilling of all revelations, these beings were wrapped in a fragile shell of flesh. They walked among us, and many of them were us. You're listening to Campfire Radio Theater, a collection of tales from the bizarre and surreal. Tonight's audio play is a story written by John Ballantyne, Demon Eyes. For Christ's sake, out of the way, slow ass. Jeez. How did I get myself into this? Stupid cell phone service. I can't get a signal through here. And now Damn it! Local news and weather. Convicted death row inmate Wesley Wayne Morrow is scheduled to be executed at 9 p.m. this evening at the Georgia. Oh God! I'm running out of time. Facility. Morrow admitted guilt in a spree of brutal killings during the 1990s and was convicted in 2001 for the murders in what was called by many an open and shut case. It is not known how many more of Morrow's victims possibly remain unaccounted for. Why did Morrow give me those eyeglasses? Why trust them to me and not someone else? And the things I can now see with them? I'll never find out if I can't get there. And save him in time. To clarify, I'm an atheist. I don't really believe in such things. At least I didn't believe in them. Not until I came face to face with something that can only be described as... A demon. This madness all started the day I met Morrow. See, I work for the FBI, a part of their criminal profiling division. I was sent to the death house in Georgia where Morrow was awaiting execution in hopes of extracting information regarding the whereabouts of 14 more bodies, more victims of his murderous rampage over a decade ago. It was here in the waiting area. I was met by Detective Paul Bellamy for the first time. Well, you must be Agent, uh... A special Agent Sarah Gowan, FBI. Hi there. Sorry about that. Paul Bellamy, Atlanta PD. So you're the one that brought in Morrow. <laughs> I've read your report and the book you wrote on his capture. It's been a lot of time on that case, Agent. So you're here to see the infamous Wesley Wayne Morrow. Once again, the Wayne Lee Ray conundrum rears its ugly head. The Wayne Lee what? Oh, nothing. It's just, ever noticed how there seems to be a disproportionate number of violent felons with the names Wayne, Lee, or Ray? John Wayne Gacy, Lee Harvey Oswald, James Earl Ray, and Mm, so on. Never heard that. (laughs) It's just a silly theory. I gotta admit, though, I, I know why you're here. Really? Yeah, you think you're going to get him to dish details on where all those other bodies are hidden, right? (laughs) If that were my plan, I couldn't discuss it, Detective Bellamy. Let me say this. You're wasting your time. Why is that? Look, I spent hours with this guy in interrogation over the years. Couldn't crack him. Now, he will admit to all of those murders, all 23 to be exact. Hell, he signed confessions to every one. But beyond the whereabouts of the nine poor souls we could find, well, he just won't tell us where the rest are. Why do you suppose that is? Your guess is as good as mine. Who knows what goes on in the head of a maniac? But if I were to venture, I'd say he hopes there might be some last-minute reprieve. Mm, A stay of execution. You think he's holding back that information because... Because it's the only card he's got left to play. Let's see, who's on the roster here? Agent Sarah Gowan. That's me. Looks like you're up first. Ever talked to a walking 
dead man before. Mr. Morrow, I'm Sarah Gowan. I'm with the FBI. I'd like to talk with you about a few things. I'm going to record our conversation, if you don't mind. Not much I can do to stop you now, is it? I suppose not, but I'd like to have your cooperation. So, let's get right down to business, shall we? There are some details in your account of the murders that I find puzzling. Ask away. I mean, this is your last chance to pick my brain, after all. Mr. Morrow, you signed a confession that you killed 23 people between the years of 1992 to 1999. Well, let's get one thing straight, Agent. They were no longer people when I killed them. Yes. You claim these individuals were, to quote, some manner of demonic beings, that they were no longer human. Is that correct? Look, I've been cursed with this burden for a long time now. I've told this story a million and one times and always the same way. It's crazy. Believe me, I know. Some nights I wake up and wonder if any of it is real to this day, but not a word of it is untrue. I'm not here to dispute any of your claims, Mr. Morrow. You've been very forthcoming with even the grisliest of details of your crimes. The part I find curious is 14 bodies remain unaccounted for. 14 families will never be able to put closure to the loss of their loved ones. In your statements, you say you are a spiritual man, Mr. Morrow, a follower of the Catholic faith. Time is running out. The state is determined to proceed with this execution. Let me assure you of that. There's not going to be a last-minute call from the governor. In three days, you will be injected with a combination of drugs that will kill you, as surely as I sit before you now. The families of your victims deserve to have answers. Why won't you at least grant them that? The answer to that is very simple, Agent Gowan. If I give up the location of those bodies, you will most definitely have them exhumed for testing and probing. God only knows what else. If those corpses are dug from the ground, then all of this will be for nothing. What do you mean? You know, I've often prayed for madness. That I'm just some garden variety nut job. What a relief it would be to awaken some padded room locked up and howling at my own shadow. Just fill me with drugs and take away this torture, right? But no. There is a keen logic to evil and the creatures that practice its dark art. They are very real. They are listening right now. How could returning the remains of these victims to their families for proper burial because possibly be Because the demons that inhabited those rotting cadavers are trapped there in the ground. If you exhume them, they are released to the world free again to plunder and rape and weave their web of wicked indulgences. Agent, do you know how to kill a demon? Can't say as I do. Neither do I. I mean, you can't kill something that doesn't live in the first place, at least doesn't live as you and I do. When a demon takes possession of a human body, it sinks roots into the soul like a twisted tree into a rich, fertile ground, and it grows like some malignancy. The bitter truth is you can't extract it without killing the host in nine out of ten cases. Most of that exorcism nonsense you hear, well, it's, it's pure garbage. You can't pull them out of someone unless they want to come out. But if one is willing to take certain measures, extreme, radical measures... Kill? Exactly. You take them by surprise before they've had a chance to adapt, to escape to another body. You can trap them. Trap them in the body. A dead body. Then what? There's a number of rituals, but essentially, the remains must be buried. Buried deep and never, never disturbed. So, how do you know the difference? How do you know when you've got someone with a demon inside them, or you've just run across some poor schmuck having a bad day? <laughs> you see these glasses that I wear? Simple, unassuming eyeglasses, wouldn't you agree? Here, take them. I'd rather not. I can barely reach them with my and shackled to this chair, but ah, there you go. What am I supposed to do with them? They're glasses. Put them on. That's good. They suit you. <laughs> if you say so. Allow your eyes to adjust them for a moment. Now, what do you see? What am I supposed to see, Mr. Morrow? What color are my eyes? You're wasting my time. 
Humor me, Agent Coward. This might give you some insight. Your eyes are blue. Good. Then that means I'm not one of them. <laughs> I'm not so sure. I've known a few blue-eyed devils in my time. Well, if you had been peering at them through those particular glasses and their eyes burned black, black as hell's heart, then you were wise to steer clear of them. This is how you decided who lived or died? Yes. And where did you get these glasses? A man I once knew. He taught me about the evil all around us. The man's name? It doesn't matter. You'll never find him. I bet I can. It's not important, Agent Gowan. In the past few years, these creatures have launched a major offensive against humankind. There are armies of them matched against us, poised to strike, and society stands vulnerable. Like sheep lined up for the slaughterhouse. They know many don't believe in them. It's to their advantage that you don't. I see we're not getting anywhere here. Your glasses? Take them. I won't be needing them much longer. I don't need them either. Keep the glasses. They're a morbid conversation piece, if nothing else. Mr. Morrow, I'll be leaving now. Wait. There's something else you need to know. One more very important thing. One would expect a serial killer such as Wesley Wayne Morrow to be profoundly disturbed. And I wasn't disappointed. But I had no idea how deeply rooted his psychosis was. Clearly Morrow was delusional, paranoid, but there was a neatness and order to his insanity that I had never encountered before. A bizarre coherence, a consistent nature to his account that I have rarely come across in someone so mentally unstable. And the glasses? Another mystery. In none of his files had I recalled him mentioning them before. Gowan, what a surprise. <laughs> Detective Bellamy, is it? Following me around now? Not at all, ma'am. <laughs> this little spot happens to be one of my favorite homes. Mind if I have a seat? <laughs> Help yourself. Thank you. Miss, would you bring my plate to this table? I'll be dining with this young lady. Yes, sir. Here you go. Thank you, dear. So, uh, I assume you'll be filing your final report on this case. I suppose. I don't guess you had any luck with him, revealing the whereabouts of those missing bodies? No. He's firmly entrenched in his own delusions. A pity, but not unexpected. Wow, that's a lot of hot sauce you're putting on that burrito. The hotter the better, Agent Gower. Are you sure you don't want a glass of something to wash that down with? Maybe I can flag our server. No, I'm perfectly fine, thank you. You know, Detective Bellamy... The thing I don't understand is why Morrow didn't plead an insanity defense during his trial. He's clearly deranged. Certainly his lawyer advised him to do so. Morrow wouldn't have it. The doctors, well, they really didn't know what to make of him. And with a clear admission of guilt in the slaves... He was sent to death row. Exactly. The evidence of the case further convicted him. The DNA at the crime scenes, the grisly nature of what Morrow did to those poor people. Even if he hadn't signed the confession, he would have been found guilty. He has no prior criminal record. Even studied to enter the priesthood at one point. I stopped trying to make sense of this sort of crime a long time ago, Agent Gowan. I mean, there was no rhyme or reason to his choice of victims. He didn't pursue young co-eds after some perverted sexual obsession or go after weak, sure targets. They came from all walks of life, social backgrounds, ethnic groups. They were men, women, children. Morrow didn't discriminate in any regard whom he killed. But when he did kill, he committed his crimes in all exactly the same perverse, ritualized manner. Do you know what he did? Can't say as I remember the details. He always struck by surprise for us with some blunt object uh, rendering his victim unconscious or worse. Certainly it was better for them if they were dead because Morrow would then slice them open cut out the heart still beating and bury it separately from the body, sometimes miles away. Then he would dispose of the body, plant it as deeply in the soil as he could. <laughs> Almost as if he didn't want to take any chances of it climbing back up to the ground. Thanks. I'm sorry, Agent Gowan. I shouldn't have been so graphic. <laughs> That's all right. It's just your description. What about it? 
It's a lot more detailed than I recall. Well, I spent a great deal of time with Moro. I know more than what was actually documented. Like the eyeglasses? The glasses? What eyeglasses? Ma'am, could you bring me a to-go box for this? I think I'll just take it with me. Certainly, miss. I'll be right back. What glasses are you talking about, Agent Gowan? The eyeglasses that Morrow wears that he claims can discern demons? Did he have them at the time of the murders? Uh, I suppose he did. He always had them as long as I can remember. He told you that they allowed him to see demons? Yes. I'm guessing that tidbit didn't make it into your book. These magic glasses. Where, where are they now, Agent Gowan? Here you go, ma'am. Have a blessed day. Thank you. Detective Bellamy, always a pleasure. Excuse me, but I have to be on my way. Enjoy your meal. I couldn't resist leaving Detective Bellamy with that befuddled look on his face. But I had no intention of contributing to his research, nor informing him that the glasses rested now solely in my possession. My investigation soon led me to St. Lawrence Catholic School. I had discovered someone from Morrow's past that might provide some answers and perhaps knew the mystery man who gave him the glasses. Pardon me, are you Father Ravano? Yes, how might I help you? My name is Sarah Gowan, special agent with the FBI. I wonder if I might have a few minutes of your time. This is about the Wesley Morrow case, I suppose. I I just had a few brief questions concerning your time with Morrow in the seminary. You were classmates at the Catholic Diocese in Kansas City, St. Joseph, correct? Yes, well, we were both on a path of theological study at that time. Both young men in our early 20s then, nearly 25 years ago now. And you were friends? Perhaps we should step into the church here for a little more privacy. You must understand, Agent Gowan, I prefer everyone not know I was once friends with a man who had become a notorious murderer. People talk whisper among themselves. None of it's beneficial to my mission. I understand. Please, have a seat. Thank you. Father Ravano, there was a teacher at the seminary that both you and Morrow studied under? Yes, Father Brooklyn. Tell me about him. Well, he was quite the charismatic figure, an eloquent speaker, a brilliant scholar. I dare say his teachings had a profound influence on us all. What about Morrow? What effect did he have on him? Oh, Morrow was a particular devotee. Disciple of Brooklyn's, I guess you could say. He was enthralled with some of Father Brooklyn's more radical views of the church and the afterlife. Really? What distinguished Brooklyn from your other teachers? Well, for one thing, Father Brooklyn was a practicing exorcist sanctioned by the Vatican, I've been told. He had done this for some time and had many, many tales, frightening stories, really. His personal experiences with evil in such real-world settings probably shaped his views and became part of our curriculum as a result. Did you agree with his views? I was open to them. And Morrow? Oh, he soaked it up like a sponge. This father, Brooklyn? He died while you were both still in studies? Yes, after a brief illness. Morrow, while he was just devastated by the loss, dropped out of the seminary a short time later, and uh, I I didn't see him again until some years ago, flipped on the news, and (laughs) there he was. Father Ravano, are you familiar with these? Blessed saints in heaven. They look like the ones Father Brooklyn wore. They were a a tool he used in his exorcisms. He even claimed to be able to see demons with them. Toward the end of his life, he wore those glasses all the time. Where did you find them? Morrow gave them to me. So I put these on and... Well, good news, Father Ravano. Your eyes look normal. Agent Gowan, these are things not meant to be toyed with. I'm sorry. I don't mean to make light of your faith, but... You must admit, this is a little bizarre. There are many sacraments, blessed objects within the church that are not public knowledge, my dear. Things hidden from the eyes of the masses. 
if the world knew what evil lurked around them, even here in the church. Please, remove the glasses. Why? Listen, you have to excuse me. I'm sorry, I, I must make ready for evening prayers. Of course. Thank you for your time, Father. Father Ravano. Father huh? Ravano. Oh, I did, did see you there. Yes, my friend, how might I help you? That's strange. I could swear. Oh my God. Certainly, my son. I, I will be here until late this evening. Please call on me after six. Yes, Father. I will call on you then. Thank you. Agent Gowan? Agent Gowan, you, are you all right? You look as pale as a sheet. Here, listen, can I, uh, can I get you That man that was just here. What was wrong with him? What do you mean? I mean, he, he comes here to confession at least once a week, but nothing his other than... His eyes. They looked right at me. His eyes. You didn't see them? Well, yes. It seemed perfectly normal to me. What kind of things does he confess to you, Father Ravana? <sighs> you know, I can't reveal that. That man has done something terrible, hasn't he? Something <sighs> monstrous, and you can't reveal it. Agent Gowan, there are things you are not meant to see. Please get rid of those glasses for your own sake. They're cursed. Morrow's proof of it. Good day to you. Father Ravana was right, but I couldn't bring myself to put them away. Would you? If you could see evil through a pair of glasses. I began to see the demons everywhere. At the corner filling station, waiting in line at the bank, at the grocery. They could be your neighbor, your mailman, even your family. I could feel their eyes on me, even in my sleep. Craving answers, I began to listen to the recorded interview I made with Marl, hoping to make some sense of this insanity. Wait. There's something else you need to know. One more very important thing. The police recovered nine bodies from ten separate burial sites. Right. One of the sites was empty. You moved one of the bodies to another site at some point? No, Agent Gowan. I never moved any of the bodies. I would never have touched it again after burial. So what happened? I fear one of them came back. I think one of those godless things pushed the earth away. Climbed from that hole. I don't understand how or why. Maybe he was more powerful than the others. Don't be ridiculous. That's impossible. These are demons we are speaking of. They're not bound by our rules or constraints. This one knew me, knew my face. He's the one that finally tracked me down. Detective Bellamy is the one who tracked you down. Yes, he is, Agent. You wanted to know where one of the missing bodies was. Well, he's waiting on the other side of that wall. Bellamy? He may not be an angel, but he's certainly no demon. Look at him through those cursed lenses, Agent Gowan. Look into his black eyes and tell me again he's not. Bellamy. He was after the glasses. I had to stop the execution. Morrow held all the answers. He was the only one that did. But now, it was almost too late. Stupid cell phone service. I can't get a signal through here. Damn it! And now for your local news and weather. Convicted death row inmate Wesley Wayne Morrow is scheduled to be executed at 9 p.m. this evening. God, I'm running out of time. So, here I am, full of fear, breaking 101 traffic laws to reach Wesley Wayne Morrow before his time runs out. Before... I'm dazed, hardly conscious as the figure from the other car that's just smashed into me approaches. I can barely make out his face before I pass out. Take it easy there, Agent Gowan. You've got a nasty bump on the head. Bellamy? You crashed into me? What the hell do you want? Right here. Wouldn't want these to fall into the wrong hands again. I knew it. The glasses. 
Why, yes. And I had to prevent you from doing something very foolhardy. <gasps> oh, God, the execution. I, I've got to stop it. Too late, dear girl. Justice is served. Morrow was dead two hours ago. Deader than all the sons of Abraham, I dare you say. You son of a bitch. Oh, don't bother reaching for your firearm. I'll keep it safe right here. Where have you taken me? A nice little rustic spot in the forest that I became acquainted with. Romantic, isn't it? This is where they found the bodies. I thought I might put you here. It's the tenth grave, the one they found empty. I'm a federal agent, Bellamy. They won't let this slide. Oh, I have friends everywhere. Some in your agency, even. Yes, you've seen my friends through these glasses, haven't you? I guess you've got this all figured out. Only there's one slight complication. What's that? I don't think I can kill you now. What kind of twisted game are you playing? You know, it was nearly 15 years ago. 15 years. The night I clawed through this black soil, pulled myself from this very whole, my beating heart was calling me. It was no convenient hike either, Miss Gowan, no. Morrow didn't make it easy for me. I staggered miles to find it, dug through the ground, shoved it back into the gaping slit in my chest. Look at the scar I bear under this shirt, even now, you see? <laughs> Ever attempt self-open heart surgery? Morrow said you were a demon all along. Demon. The word has such a negative connotation these days. What about the others? I was the only one of Morrow's victims to escape this fate. Or so I thought. What do you mean? How far back do you remember? What does that have to do with anything? Do you recall your youth? Your childhood? Your parents? What difference does it make? Your parents? You don't remember them, their names? Strange, but I can't recall. I can't even see their faces. There was once a family that lived in a little farmhouse over in the next county. A man and his wife, two kids, one of them a girl of about 12, I guess. Why are you telling me this? You were only a girl when he murdered you, Sarah. That's why you don't remember. You were one of Morrow's early victims, one of those 14 bodies they never found. What are you saying? Morrow saw the darkness growing in you with those damnable glasses. He could not let you live. Murdered your entire family on that night. Your parents, your little brother. You're lying. You drugged me with something to dull my senses, uh, to confuse me. You clawed yourself from that grave just as I did. Woke to the sound of your throbbing heart and rose from the ground, the innate beast within you forged ahead to find that most crucial organ. You've never wondered the origin of your scar, the deep wound Morrow inflicted on you. Didn't recognize Morrow when you sat face to face with him with your assassin. If, if I was one of you, why did he give me the glasses? His vision deteriorated rapidly in prison. Morrow, Morrow was nearly blind. (laughs) The delicious irony of it all. No, this is all a lie. Come now, dear. You know it's not. You've lived in a fog, forgotten who you are, what you truly are under that veil of human flesh. Walk freely now into the darkness. There's nothing to fear when you walk with the unholy. Take my hand. How can this be? Take my hand, sir. If I come with you, will I become evil? What is evil? You don't believe in this sort of thing, do you? Will I become evil? Oh, there are plans for you, my dear. Most assuredly. Actually... Detective, I've got some plans of my own. (laughs) Dear girl, whatever is it you're hiding in that other hand? Always strike first with some blunt object, like a rock you've concealed behind your back. 
Isn't that how you said Morrow did it? Oh, but I see you're not unconscious yet, are you? Sorry, Detective Bellamy. I'll take those glasses, though. Now what, Bellamy? I should cut out that heart of yours. That's the next step in this ritual, isn't it? Of course, that didn't work out too well the last time. After all, you didn't stay buried, did you? Those black eyes still staring back at me? What would happen if I plucked them right out of your head? Would you still find your way from this hole? Perhaps I'll lay you face down in this ground, let you dig yourself deeper and deeper. Well, let's get to work. There's one. And the other. Perhaps Bellamy was right. Maybe I was one of them and I just couldn't remember, or maybe I had just descended into madness. I felt like I had awoke from a dream, a dream just on the edge of consciousness, hazy and unclear. As I would stare at my reflection, my own eyes were reflected back at me. I was okay. Could that darkness within me have fled? I can never know for sure. I must be forever vigilant, watchful, as we all should. Even now I wear the glasses. For still I fear that one morning I might rise and find the eyes staring at me through the mirror are not mine, but those of a demon. You've been listening to Campfire Radio Theater. Tonight's tale, Demon Eyes, was written, directed, and produced by John Ballantyne. Featured in the cast were Diane Gilbert as Sarah Gowan, Alan Pierce as Detective Bellamy, John Ballantyne as Wesley Wayne Morrow, Blaine Hicklin as Father Ravano. Also featured were Teresa Ballantyne and Jeffrey Lester. Music by Kevin McLeod. Sound design by Tim Holding and John Ballantyne. Additional sound courtesy of Free Sound Project. Mixing and post-production by John Ballantyne. Share the horror and visit us at CampfireRadioTheater.com and on Facebook at Campfire Radio Theater. Welcome, friend. Have a seat by the fire. Make yourself comfortable. The house was old, but not ancient. It creaked and groaned with the wind shifted upon its foundations. Many had walked its floors, cast shadows upon its walls, but few stayed long. For some would claim it seemed to attract unwelcome guests, passing visitors from an unnatural realm. You're tuned to Campfire Radio Theater, a collection of tales of the bizarre and surreal. Tonight's audio play written by John Ballantyne. Careful you don't catch. The Night Chill. That's the last of them. Can't see our house for the boxes. <laughs> I didn't know we had so much stuff. What's in these? Careful. Where to? The bedroom. Now, 
God. Justin, what is it? Is this a box of bricks or your makeup? <sighs> You're trying to give me a coronary. <laughs> you know I got mad love for you. Come on, let's go. I think we're really gonna like this place. I mean, nice neighborhood, close to work for you, and plenty of opportunities for me when I go back. Oh, yeah. It needs some work, but... What time is it? Um, about midnight, I think. You hear that? What? How quiet it is. It's so peaceful here. Yep. Just what the doctor ordered after everything we've been through. Let's not even... Don't even think about it. We're in a new place, a new town. All that's behind us now. Right. I'm going to take a shower. My day kicks off early. That's right. The new job. Let's see. Shampoo. Ah, so. Hey, you want to jump in with me? Save a little water? Maybe next time, cowboy. Good stuff, Debbie Downer. Hey, uh, you grab me a towel? Sure thing, you help with baby. What was that? Oh, nothing. Here you go. So, excited about the big day? What do you mean? The new job. Oh, yeah. First day. Loads of fun. Well, we didn't have to move. Uh, I think we did the right thing, don't you? We did, we did what we needed to do. Hey, there's a hardware store just up the road. If I get this stuff unpacked tomorrow, I'd like to look at some paint samples. I'm going to be late getting home. Your position's probably a little more demanding. At least it pays more. Yeah, well, I've got plenty to do around here anyway. You need to turn in. You'll be all sleepy-eyed on your first day. How about you? You gotta be bushed. Huh. I'm gonna do a little laundry. Washer and dryer's plugged in, right? Yeah, took care of it this morning. Good night. Night, baby. Oh, I think I was a total radio. Usually puts me right out. Time you came to bed. Cut the light on if you need to. Oh. It's gonna be a long day tomorrow. Guess who's the new kid on the block? Gotta play kissy face with everybody. I'm not looking forward to. Hey, what are you doing? Better not be starting something you ain't willing to finish here, Missy. Mm. Wait a second. Did I just see a light come on down the hallway? Somebody is in the house. Uh. Uh. Where's that nine millimeter? I know I put it over here somewhere, damn it. Where is it? Got it. Jelani, stay right here. Be very quiet. I can see a shadow moving in the other room. Oh, Jesus, maybe I should have told Jill to call 911. There's nobody here in the living room but the kitchen. I see movement. Someone's in there. You're in a world of hurt if you don't step out of there, you hear me? Right now! Justin, what in the hell? Oh my god, what are you doing? Put that gun away! What? How did you get in here? You were you were back there in the in the bedroom just now. What are you talking about? 
talking about? I've been in here unpacking all night. Just got all the plates done. Justin, what's going on? Justin? Oh, God. Oh, my God. Justin, what is it? What happened? You came to bed. I mean, you were, you were just here. What? Maybe you were dreaming. No. You cut the radio off, came to bed. I felt your body next to me, but it was like you were, you were cold. We shouldn't have left this window open. Somebody could have come in. She's doing it again, isn't she? I don't have a clue how she figured out where we moved to. I mean, we only told a few close friends, and most of them don't even know her. It's frustrating. We've got a restraining order, but what do you do with someone like that? She's unhinged. Jeez, look at the time. Hey, Mom, I'll give you a buzz later, okay? Bye now. Well, you look dapper. I'm gonna be late. First day, too. They'll understand. Here, new cheese blueberry muffin. Mm. Not bad. You want me to call the police today? About what? About Kristen. I'm not gonna have that little slut sneaking into our house trying to molest my husband. I mean, what the hell? She's still obsessed over you. I know. I figured moving to a new town and all. Well, I thought she wouldn't keep stalking you. She's done a lot of crazy things, but breaking and entering? She knows I've got the gun. I, I don't think she would take that kind of risk. That's another thing. Can we talk about this gun? You almost killed me last night. Look, I, I'm sorry. It wouldn't have fired anyway. I still had the safety on. That doesn't make me feel much better. Jill, I'm going to take you out to the range, show you how to shoot, okay? Once you know how to use it, you'll feel a lot safer having a gun in the house. Sure. I still can't shake the feeling that wasn't Kristen. Maybe this place is haunted. No, I just... Maybe I did dream the whole thing. It was so real. Hey, is that the old guy from yesterday across the street? Where? Out the window. Keeps looking over here. Oh, yeah, it looks like him. You think he's a ghost? No, but my career is if I don't hit the road soon. I'll call you later. Okay, drive safe. Welcome home. Hey, what you doing out here? I'm playing around in the rosebud a little bit. Couldn't help it. Kind of hot, isn't it? Not too bad. How was your first day? Um, okay, I guess. Everybody seems cool. Just trying to fit in. How did things go here? Well, I had a couple of weird issues. Hmm, what happened? I don't know if it's the old pipes or what, but the place makes some noises. What kind of noises? Loud bangs. Like somebody just knocks the hell out of the wall all of a sudden. I thought somebody else was in the house, but no. Just me. And then the phone calls. They were non-stop this morning. Hmm. Who was it? Nobody. I mean, nobody answered anyway. It's kind of the same stupid crap Kristen used to pull, only I have no idea how she could have found our number so quickly. We just had the line connected yesterday. Mm, I wouldn't worry. I'll check out the plumbing later. Make sure we don't have a leak somewhere. Looks like we've got a visitor. Huh? The old guy from across the street. Hi there, folks. Just thought I'd come over and introduce myself. Bernard Willis. Hi. Oh, nice to meet you, Bernard. Justin Chavis. This is my wife, Jill. You're the first neighbor we've met so far. Well, actually, I, I don't live here anymore. Just doing a little work on the house across the street. My youngest daughter lives there now. Honey, I'm going to go and get dinner started. Nice to meet you, Mr. Willis. Likewise, ma'am. So, how do you like the house? Oh, it's just what we needed. About the right size. You two don't have any kids, do you? No, not yet. <laughs> Why do you ask? Well, uh, I don't mean to put you off on the place. Perhaps I shouldn't even mention it. M mention what? Well, the the history behind your new home, Mr. Chavis. <laughs> Sounds ominous. Uh, what kind of history? I mean, I, I know it was built in the late 40s. Lots of 
GIs returning from war were living in this neighborhood, as I understand. Yes, uh, my father was one. Grew up in that house across the street. It was passed on to me. I passed it on to my daughter. Tell me, have you experienced any strange occurrences here? Well, now that you mention it, maybe one or two. Nothing that can't be explained. Uh, you trying to say the place is haunted or something? <laughs> well, that used to be the story. Me personally, I don't know that I believe in ghosts or the supernatural. But for some reason, everyone that's lived in this house, particularly the uh, younger couples, well, they seem to have experiences. Hmm. Somebody die here? In this house? Well, there, there was a murder and suicide back in the 50s. I was just a boy then, but... I remember the Fosters. Mr. Foster, he, he was a Marine. Come back from Korea paralyzed from the waist down. Wasn't much they could do for you back then, you know? What happened? Oh, it, it was quite the scandal. Mrs. Foster being a young, attractive lady, well, let's just say it was difficult for Mr. Foster to, uh, you know, meet her needs in his injured state. And, and all too many other men more than willing and able. Once Mr. Foster caught wind of his wife's uh, indiscretions one night, there was a huge fight. He shot her dead with a 38 revolver. Then he turned the gun on himself. God, awful bloody scene. So, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Foster are haunting the place to this day. Is that kind of how the local legend goes? Nonsense, isn't it? But the fact remains... I've never seen a young couple stay in that house for longer than a year or two. Don't know why. Perhaps it's just a coincidence. You got a theory for why these ghosts seem to only run off the young couples? Well, I've heard it said that Mrs. Foster, even in her otherworldly state, still fancies the young men that can please her in ways that Mr. Foster couldn't. And that Mr. Foster can still be a very, very jealous husband. <laughs> Oh, it makes a good story anyway. <laughs> yeah, it does. Uh, listen, I, I'm sorry. I, I need to get in and unwind. Of course. You and your lovely wife take care, Mr. Chavis. Justin? Are you okay? Justin? Why is it why is it so cold in here? Maybe you're freezing. Are you having chills? I don't know. Let, let me hold that blanket at the foot of the bed. Can you reach it? Yeah, just hold on. I thought it was laying here on on the You, you want me to you want me to cut the light on? <coughs> Jill! What's wrong? What, what happened? Something just grabbed my hand! What? It, it felt like another hand! Ice cold! I, I got the flashlight. I'm gonna take a look. Be careful! I, I don't see anything at the, at the foot of the bed. C cut your lamp on. Nothing, nothing here. Oh my god, what was that? Are you sure you weren't still half asleep? No, I was fully awake. I woke you up! Justin, that scared the hell out of me. What's going on here? I don't know, but I... I better check out the other rooms. No, don't go. Just to be safe. You're not going to find anything. Whatever it is, it, it's gone. How can, you, how can you be so sure? I'm not. It's just... Okay. Okay. Maybe we should just, uh... Try to get some sleep then. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. Look at my arms. I've still got goosebumps. Just try to lay back. Calm down. I'm here. I'll protect you. You're not going to be around tomorrow, Justin. You're still so cold. I'm all right. Everything's all right. It's not your crazy ex harassing us this time. It's something else, Shh. isn't it? Seven, you 
know, 7.30? Your, your new employer must be a slave driver, man. Oh, I'm just trying to catch up on some work here. Haven't been getting much shut-eye lately. We've had some crazy stuff going on with the new house. How's things back in the old neighborhood? Oh, oh, that's, that's what I was calling you about. Sent you an email the other day. I mean, just, just a few old pictures. I figured you'd have buzzed me back by now. Yeah, I need to text you the new email. Kristen used to bug the crap out of me at that older dress, so I, I just stopped checking it. I'll give it a look. Oh, yeah, the head case, yeah. It sucks you guys had to move to get away from her. Me and Amy really miss hanging out with you, too. Uh, hey, Doug, uh, let me give you a call back later. Jill's on the line. Sure thing, but don't be a stranger. Uh, hey, baby. Everything all right? Actually, it's been pretty quiet. Maybe the spirits aren't so restless today. What time are you coming home? Oh, gosh, I don't know. I got so much work to do. Well, you can't work all night. Oh, I could. It's just my eyes are rolling back in my head right now. <laughs> Give me another hour. I'm going to pull up these pictures Doug Gentry emailed. Take care of a few more things, and then I'll be home. Okay. Are you sure? Justin, you know I don't like to be here by myself, especially after dark. All the weird little incidents and those ghost stories the neighbors tell. It's just, sometimes I feel like there's something else here. Something not us. I know that's crazy, Hey, but... I'm going to wrap things up here as soon as I can. Let me check these emails, and I'll be on my way. Thanks. You know I got mad love for you. I know. Later, cowboy. <laughs> well, all right, let's see what we have here. Doug Gentry, Doug Gentry, some NWS porn. Let's delete that. Here we are. Old neighborhood pics. Hmm, what's this? Only one email from Kristen? How refreshing. Should we bother? Oh, why not? Oh, wow, a webcam video. <laughs> You've discovered new and improved ways to annoy me. Justin, it's me. Kristen. Oh, that's a shocker. I know things went really sour between us, and I was angry for a very long time. I mean, you had to go and marry that bitch. <sighs> Did you just do that to hurt me? After everything we meant to each other and all the good Christ, times. We were only together six months. Get over it. I bet she doesn't even know about the last night we had together. Right before the wedding. Did you ever tell her? Did you, Justin? What the hell is she talking you about? You remember that night, don't you? After the bachelor party your stupid friends gave you. I don't even remember how I got home that night. How I slipped into your bed while you slept and slid in next to you. How we made love. What we had, it was special, Justin. Magical. That evil slut raped me while I was passed out. And I need to have that again. I can't go on without you, Justin. I can't face another day like this. We belong together, you and I, and that's why... Oh no, Kristen, what are you I've doing with it? I've set this recording to be automatically sent to your inbox when it's finished. <laughs> I just want you to see how much you mean to me, Justin. I want you to see that I'm willing to shed my life's blood for you. Oh, for God's sake. You remember this hunting knife? It was yours. It's still very sharp. Most people aren't serious when they slash their wrists. Just a few scratches. They don't really want to die. I'm going to open this artery all the way up to my elbow, Justin. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Oh my god. Are you watching, Justin? This is for you, honey. This is for you. Oh. Ah! Ah! There! I give my life for you, Justin. Everything. Would she do this for you, your lovely little bitch, Jill? This is the only way. The only way. Ah! God. Ah! 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 Oh, when did she send this? Oh, God. Four days ago. Hey, Doug, I, I need you to do me a big favor. Sure, what's up? Are you near Kristen's apartment complex? Uh, yeah, 
actually, yeah, I'm about to pass it on the way home. What? Pull in, will you? Do you remember where her place is? Yeah, pulling in. Uh, her place is near the front here, right? Yeah, Amy's got a friend that lives close by. We're over here all the time. You want me to check and see if she's got some guy shacking up with her or something? No. I need you to go knock on her door. Are you nuts? What if she's off her meds? Doug, this is very important. All right, all right, all right. All right. I'm heading uh, uh, to her door now. It's on the lower level, number 20, 21, 22, right? You sound shook up. What's going on? She just sent me a video. Something kinky? I think she may have tried to kill herself. Jesus, okay. I'm knocking. Looks like we'd have heard something about it around here. If, uh, she's not answering. Looks like a car parked out front, though. Uh, just open it. Uh, check and see if, um... We're not locked. Anybody could just waltz right in. Hey, are you sure about this? Yeah. Uh, look around. Do you see anything? Yeah, it looks like a light on in the bedroom. I'm gonna check it out. <clears throat> hey, Kristen? This is, uh, Doug Gentry, Justin's friend. He just wanted me to come check on you, so, uh... Don't try to kill me, okay? Anybody here? Anybody... What is it, Doug? What do you see? Oh, sh- oh, oh, man. What? What is it? Oh, this, this, this is, a, this is a bad mess, man. This is she. She's bled out all over the whole carpet. She's dead, man. She's been, de- she's been dead for a while. I think I'm gonna be sick. <laughs> Doug. <laughs> Doug. Ah, disconnected. Voicemails. First message. Justin, it started again. The noises. It felt like something just pulled my hair. You've got to come home. Next message. Why aren't you answering the friggin' phone? I need you to come home now. I'm in the closet. I'm too afraid to move. Justin, there's something in the house. I don't know. End of message. Pick up the damn phone. Come on. There's the house. Why are all the lights off? Jill! Ah, oh, son of a bitch, the power's out. Lights are on across the street, must have tripped a breaker. What the hell? Jill, is that you? <sighs> Damn, boxes everywhere. It's so dark, I can't see my hand in front of my face. Why is it so cold in here? <laughs> what was that? Who's there? Jill! Sounds like she's in the bedroom. It's okay. I'm here. Doors jammed. This is crazy. It won't. No! For God's sake, leave me alone! Hold on, Jill. I'm coming. Are you okay? I think so. The noises, they started again after I called and the lights went out and it got worse. Footsteps and doors slamming. I could feel a presence here, so I grabbed the gun. Justin? Oh God, Justin, is that you? I think you better call an ambulance. I think you got me pretty good. Where are you, Justin? I can feel it! I'm sorry! I'm so sorry! It's alright. 
right, baby. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Jesus, pick up! Yes! Please, I need an ambulance at 153 Riverwood Lane! My husband! He's got a gunshot wound and it just happened! Please, hurry! They're on their way, honey. It's so cold in here. I'll get you a blanket. No, don't leave me. Baby, who's standing in the corner there? There's no one here, Justin. Just me and you now. It's her. She's come for me. Who? You're scaring me, Justin. It's Kristen. She's dead, you know. Don't let her take me. Don't let her take me. Justin, squeeze my hand. Hold on. Try to hold on. have Justin. It's special. Magical. You've been listening to Campfire Radio Theatre. Tonight's tale, Night Chills, was written, directed, and produced by John Ballantyne. Featured in the cast were John Ballantyne as Justin, Alison Manley as Jill, Shelby Sessler as Kristen, Blaine Hicklin as Doug Gentry, and Larry Perkins as Bernard. Music by Kevin McLeod. The song Lullaby, performed by Ghost. Sound design by Tim Holding and John Ballantyne. Additional sound provided by Free Sound Project. Mixing and post-production by John Ballantyne. Share the horror and visit us at campfireradiotheatre.com and on Facebook at Campfire Radio Theatre. Welcome, friend. Have a seat by the fire. Make yourself comfortable. Leather cowhide straps bound him to the chair. That chair that smelled of burnt meat. Witnesses were seated before him, gathered like an opening night crowd, their faces cold, devoid of compassion, humanity. Their voices hushed and hollow. He now pitied those that came before him, and those that would follow. For this would not be quick. Two thousand volts were about to course through the body of Skeeter Dempsey for nearly a full minute, each moment carving out its own tortured eternity. You're listening to Campfire Radio Theater. Tonight's audio play is from the classic Lights Out tale, written by Willis Cooper, and titled appropriately, The Haunted Cell. So you don't believe in ghosts, huh? Well, let me tell you something. Guys that don't believe in ghosts is guys that ain't never seen none. Ain't that right? I can tell you a ghost story that'll make your hair curl. I'll say it'll make your hair curl. Listen. 
Last August, I was nabbed by a couple of coppers. Never mind the details. It just so happened, and they come up on me when I was sticking up a filling station. Or oh, they drug me in. It was a tough rap to beat, since they got me standing there flat-footed, holding a gun on one of the filling station guys, and, well, the coppers didn't like me much anyway. Huh? Oh yeah, sure. Because well, they pegged me for bumping off some copper just a week or two before. And wouldn't it be my luck to be picked up by this guy's partner? Well, they took me in, decided to show me the goldfish. Don't know what that is, huh? Well, I'll tell you. You're a stinking liar. Yeah? So what, copper? You rat! I know you knocked off Ambrose Hogan, and you're gonna fry for it! You gotta prove it first, Miller. Pull the light over this way a little more, John. Right in his eyes. Yeah, I'll prove it. Go ahead. Hand me the hose, John. Now, now look here. Don't you go... Oh! No! Oh. Now what do you say? I'm not gonna rap to no... To go! You ain't, huh? No. You wait till I get to a mouthpiece, Miller. You're gonna be walking a beat... Out in Circleville, where the... go oh, Won't make no difference to you, punk. Where I'm walking a beat. Uh, Not when you're burned. Yeah? yeah? Who's gonna burn me? You knocked off Ambrose Hogan! I was in Omaha the night he got knocked off. Listen, Maxie, get this now. Ambrose Hogan was a real swell guy. When I seen him laying on a slab downstairs, I took a solemn oath. I get the scum and done it, even if it took me 50 you years. You ought to hire a... Oh! I'll get you for this, copper. <laughs> I don't think you're going to get anything out of him, Miller. There's a smart copper, Miller. Yeah? Listen, I got a way to get things out of smart guys like you, Maxie. Come on over here, John. You sure about this, Miller? I have nothing on my conscience. This guy popped my pocket. You know? You got a score to set. Uh, what are you going to do? Let's just make sure we're together on this thing. Now listen, Miller. Shut up! Cell I gotta put him in. You can't. I, can put him I, I in want a lawyer. Want you you gotta let me have a lawyer. Exactly. Alright, we're together on this thing, right? <clears throat> you wanna sing, Maxie, or you wanna spend a few hours in the haunted cell upstairs? The what? <laughs> oh, another gag, huh? Think so? Listen, I bet you eight dollars you'll change your mind, baby. Get up! What are you gonna. Hey, get going! Go ahead, John. Open the door. My pleasure. What are you going to do to me? I'm a little skeet of Dempsey, Maxie. Come on! This way. Well, what about him? Well, they burned him last winter. Yeah, that's right. Friend of yours? I knowed him. Well, that's just fine, Maxie. Yes, sir. That'll be just dandy. What you asking about Skeeter Dempsey for, Miller? <laughs> yeah. Old Skeeter. He killed a cop or two. So what? <laughs> It's a bad business, killing coppers, Max. Already, John? Yeah, already. Home sweet home. Right this way, Maxie, my boy. What you up to? I tell you. Try it in there. I said, get in there, you. Why, oh, you? Listen. This here's the cell that Skeeter Dempsey was locked up in when he first came here. He liked the cell, Maxie. He still likes it. Well, what do you mean? He'll probably be around to see you before the night's over. Oh, yeah. Yeah, another one of your gags, huh? See, this whole car at a maxi, you're the only guy in it. Except Skeeter Dempsey. Hey, we'll see what a night here with him will do to you. Huh, John? <laughs> yep. Hey, if you get scared, Maxie, just call. Just yell, you know? I mean, nobody will pay any attention to it. Nobody at all. Except maybe Skeeter. <laughs> Good night, Max. Come on, John. Hey! Now listen! Pleasant dreams. You don't scare me, Miller. Uh, I know your gags. You can't scare me. No? Well, we'll see about that. Ghosts! Hey! I want a lawyer. Good night, Maxie. 
Hey! You can't turn out the lights on me! Miller! Turn the lights back on! Miller! You can't leave me in here in the dark! Can't, huh? <laughs> Miller! Miller! Why are you, are you flat-footed? Miller, come back here! Miller! Turn, turn the lights on, Miller! For the love of Mike! I, I don't like the dark! Yeah, go on! Now turn the lights on, Miller! Miller! Take me out of here! Miller! Miller! Cut out the yelling, Maxie. <sighs> and sit down. Who? Who are you? Oh, don't you know me, Maxie? You? You you can't be. It's a gag. Listen, Kappa. I'm no Kappa, Max. Sit down. As you and me talk about things. Well, where are you? Right here. Wait. Wait till I light a match. I, I want to see what you look like. You'd be surprised, Max. Where are you hiding? Uh, there ain't nobody there. <laughs> oh, sure there is, Maxie. I'm right here beside you, kid. Yeah, it was Skeeter Dempsey, all right. I recognized his voice right away. When I lit up the match and couldn't see nobody there, I guess I fainted. For a minute, I couldn't figure out what happened. And then, it all come back to me. You know how it is when you're really scared? Well, maybe you ain't never been scared, huh? Well, I'll tell you. My mouth was so dry, I couldn't hardly breathe. All I could hear was my heart a-pumping away as loud as an old flipper engine. I was too scared to say a word. I just crawled up onto the bunk and laid there, listening, listening. Awful jumper there, huh, Max? Listen, uh, go away now, uh, whoever you are, just go away. Oh, shut up, I ain't gonna hurt you. Well, I could pray you away. <laughs> no, you couldn't, Maxie. You couldn't pray me away. What I got you in here for? Uh, dumping up. Uh, nothing. You knocked off that Hogan guy, didn't you? Well, it's too bad for you, Max. Well, how do you know? You? You ain't no Skeeter Dempsey. If only that were true. Well, listen. Oh, Skeeter Dempsey was fried last winter. I know an old padre that's seen him set in the chair. Said he burned so hot you could smell it. That's right. Well, then you ain't Skeeter Dempsey. <laughs> Oh, this ain't real! It ain't, it ain't real! <laughs> Stop gibbering, I ain't gonna hurt you. But you're a ghost! Well, what if I am? I wish you'd go away. Oh, why should I? This is my cell after all. Oh, oh, Skeeter, please! Ah, oh, can it? Listen, <laughs> let's talk. <laughs> I haven't had nobody to talk to in two months now. Well, who'd you talk to then? George Brown. You remember him? Yeah. Uh, George Brown. Him and me sat up and talked all night, and he hung himself next day. Right in this spot. Well, what'd he hang himself for? Oh, he'd have got burned anyway. They had him for two jobs. One knocking off an old lady for 70 bucks, and the other shooting that bank guy down in Springfield. Did you see him uh, hang himself, Skeeter? No, I wasn't here at the time. Where was you? Oh, I was away. Skeeter? Yeah? What does it feel like to be dead? All right, I guess. Dear God. What's the matter? What about hell and all that? You get used to it. My old lady used to make me go to Sunday school, and they used to talk about hell there. Fire and everything. There ain't no fire. No? No, it's, uh, it's worse than that. Worse? What's it like? You'll find out. If I get out of this wrap, I'm, 
I think I'll go straight. You're too late, Max. No, I ain't. I'll beat it. No, you won't. You gotta pay. Someday, yeah. You'll die on this rap. How do you know? Ah. There's one way you could get out of some of the hell, though, Max. How? Bump yourself off. What do you mean? Well, if you wait for the law to punish you, that's one thing. If you take the law in your own hands and, well, kind of punish yourself, it'd make a difference. Is it pretty tough, Skeeter? What? Hell? Dying. It hurts awful. The chair, I mean. You go in feeling pretty cocky. Figuring you can take it and you're gonna be a tough guy and all. And then... And then what, Skeeter? All of a sudden you find you can't take it. You don't want to yell and scream, but... Yeah, well, it's agony. What's it feel like? You ain't ever had no pain in all your life, Max, can begin to compare with the chair. You'll find out. I wonder how it feels to bump yourself off. Yeah, George Brown said it was all right. Kind of made him feel better, he said. He said? Yeah, I seen him the day after. If I was you, Max, I, I think I'd do it. Yeah. I'm not going to bump myself off. These lousy coppers ain't going to make me. Who's that? It's Miller. Is that you, Miller? Who is you talking to, Maxie? Listen, Miller. Let me out of here. No kidding. Let me out. Put me any place you want to. But listen. Scared, Maxie? Who was you talking to? For the love of... Listen, Miller. Turn on the lights, will you? Turn them on, Miller, just for a minute. Well, why not? It'll be darker still when I turn them off again, right? Oh! What's the matter now? Miller, well, there ain't nobody here. Was Skeeter in here with you, kid? I thought... I thought... There ain't anybody here. <laughs> oh, yes, there is, Max. It I wouldn't worry about it, Max. I'm right here beside you. And I'm gonna stay. They kept me in that cell for four weeks. Every once in a while, Miller would come in and stand there in front of the door and laugh at me. Gonna sign a confession, Maxie? He'd say. I wasn't gonna give him nothing. That place got me. Just as soon as it was dark, I'd hear Skeeter Dempsey's footsteps, and he'd come and sit down with me. I was awful scared at first. Kinda hard to get used to practically living with a ghost. But then I got used to him. He was always telling me how I was gonna burn, how I'd be better off to hang myself like George Brown done. Guess I was a little bit nuts. Miller wouldn't let me have no lawyer, see? Now he was keeping me in there so they could hand me the rap when the time come. Well, the time come. So, someplace or other, Miller dug up the evidence that I wouldn't give them, and they had me. And how? They had me. So one morning, a few weeks later, I'm sitting in the courtroom. The jury's been out for 20 minutes. Everybody rise. Take your seats. Gentlemen of the jury, have you arrived at a verdict? We have, Your Honor. Will you pass the verdict to the bailiff, please? We, the jury, find the defendant, Max Young, guilty of murder in the first degree. Mr. Foreman, is this your verdict? It is, Your Honor. The defendant will rise. Get up, Maxie. Maximilian Theodore Young, have you anything to say before sentence is passed on you? No, Your Honor. You realize that in a verdict of guilty of first-degree murder, 
The death penalty is mandatory. Yeah. Yeah, Your Honor. Very well. Then it is the sentence of this court that you are to be taken from this place and between the 21st and the 30th of December. Shocked to death by electricity. And may God have mercy on your soul. All right, Maxie. Come on this way. Well, Max, that's that. Yeah. Only one way out now. Yeah? One way out. There wasn't money to send me down to the state prison where they bump off guys, so they kept me here in the cell, here in the wing of the old county jail where they had me, in Skeeter Dempsey's cell. I guess this Miller guy must have liked his pal Ambrose Hogan quite a lot. The guy I knocked off. Yeah, I guess he must have thought a lot of him. Cause he kept me in there where it was dark, where I'd be scared to death all the time. Really getting even. But I kinda fooled him. I wasn't so scared of Skeeter by this time. I got so I'd sit in the dark there and be waiting for him. And we'd talk about everything in the world. People out of history and old places and stuff and a lot of things. Skeeter told me he saw a lot of the guys we talked about. Nero and Judas Iscariot. But why not? He was dead, wasn't he? And so was they. Oh, but I gotta hurry up with my ghost story, ain't I? That's right. Uh, what I was gonna say was, I was sitting there one night, the 23rd, it was, day before Christmas Eve, sitting in the dark, and I hear Skeeter come in. Hello, Skeeter. Max, how you feeling? Not so hot. Still thinking about the hot squad, huh? What else are you expecting to think about? I wish they'd hurry up and get it over with. That's what I wish. It's tomorrow night. What is? They burn you. On Christmas Eve? Yeah. Honest, Skeeter. How do you know? Uh, I found out. Oh, oh God. Well, don't take it so hard. I walk in with you when they take you to the chair. I'll stand right there alongside you. Oh, will you, Skeeter? Will you, honest? Sure. Won't do you much good, though. Why? I can't keep it from hurting. Honest, Skeeter. Oh, does it? Does it hurt a lot? Or is it? All over with pretty quick. It seemed to me to last a hundred years. Oh, I'm a sucker for pain, Skeeter. You ain't felt nothing yet. Gee, I remember too when I busted my leg. My old lady sat up all night holding my hand and, and me bowling. This would feel like a million busted legs. Well, listen, Skeeter. Didn't you say George Brown told you it didn't hurt much bumping yourself off? That's what he said. I know what I would do if I was in your place. Yeah? Would you bump yourself off? Yeah. I I don't think I got the guts to do it, Skeeter. Yeah, it ain't hard. You got a belt. Uh, you could get it around your neck. Climb up on the bunk and fasten the belt to the bars up above. Then all you got to do is... Jump off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it would help you out if you did. Well, what do you mean? Well, you know, I told you. You'd be kind of punishing yourself, see. I know. But I can't, Skeeter. I, I can't. I, I don't want to die. Well, it's all right with me. I was just telling you. And believe me, lad, I know what I'm talking about. Do you? Honest, Skeeter, do you? Yeah. I wish I had the guts to do it. I don't care what you do, Maxie. Only, you're going to get burned tomorrow night anyway. And if you want to get out of the most awful pain you ever had and do yourself a good turn at the same time, well... Uh, I wonder what it feels like. George Brown said it only hurt for a minute. 
Well, he never had much guts. That that I remember. <laughs> no. Here comes Miller. Gonna tell you, I guess. Yeah. He don't look real happy. Can you see in the dark? Yeah. Hello, Max. Miller? Want me to turn on the lights? I don't care. Getting used to the dark, huh? Yeah. Well, I'll, uh... I'll turn them on anyway. Huh? Well, Max. About the end of the string, eh? Tomorrow's the day, huh? And I guess that makes you and me even. The score's settled then. Listen, Max. I wanted to see you knocked off on account of Ambrose Hogan. I mean, justice had to be served, you know? No hard feelings, Miller. It's, it's your job being a copper and mine being a hood. Yeah, I suppose. Anything you want? No. Oh, nothing I figure. You got no folks? Nope. Could get you a bottle of bourbon if you wanted. Nah. What's the use? Well... We gotta get ready to go down to state prison in a while. They'll be waiting on you. I have to go today? I guess so. Well, I kinda hate to leave this place at that. Do ya? Scared me quite a lot at first, but I guess it taught me a lot. Being here in the dark all alone. Well, Max, listen. Try to take it standing up, will ya? You know, you don't wanna... I'll try, Miller. But it's going to be awful tough. Yeah. Well, I'll be back in a little bit and we'll go. Uh, sure there ain't anything you want me to get? Nope. All right. I told you, Max. I know. Well, I got to be going. So long, Max. You going, Skeeter? Yeah. I'll, uh... I'll see you tomorrow night. But listen, Skeeter, uh, don't go away now. Oh, I have to. That's just kind of the way things are. <laughs> Good luck to you, Maxie. Well, there you are. And that's your ghost story. You believe in ghosts now? You don't? Well, you oughta. You see, I took Skeeter's advice. I hung myself. I've been dead six months. been listening to Campfire Radio Theatre. Our audio play for this evening, The Haunted Cell, was written by Willis Cooper. This series is produced and directed by John Ballantyne. Featured in the cast were Rob McHugh as Maxie, Blaine Hicklin as Miller, John Ballantyne as Skeeter Dempsey. Also featured were Glenn Haskell, Scott Spaulding and Alex Pinnock. Music by Tom Cusack and Kevin McLeod. Incidental music performed by the Trinity Choir. Our whistle artist was Glenn Haskell. Sound design by Tim Holding and John Ballantyne. Additional sound provided by Free Sound Project. Mixing and post-production by... John Ballantyne. Visit us at campfireradiotheatre.podbean.com and on Facebook at Campfire Radio Theatre. Welcome, friend. Have a seat by the fire. Make yourself comfortable.
It was a maddening conclusion, one that she now deeply dreaded. There was nowhere she could flee to escape the voices, those lost souls aimlessly seeking what could never be found. Nowhere to flee, for there was not a single patch of this haunted earth not sprinkled with the dust of the dead. And the whole world was a tomb. You're listening to Campfire Radio Theater. Our All Hallows' Eve tale was scripted by John Ballantyne and guides us on a shadowy quest for the ever-elusive Twilight Road. Well, that takes care of Mr. Roberts. Doris will be in tomorrow for hair and makeup. Judging by the decomposition, this will be a closed casket. Such a shame. Poor man died there in that apartment. No one found him for, what, nearly a week? Unfortunately, that's what happens with the elderly. Those that live alone tend to be forgotten. A fine job considering the shape he was in. Good work, Tori. Thank you. A bit more of a challenge than usual. Stay in the mortuary business for long and you'll encounter a lot worse, trust me. Wow. I had no idea it was this late. Guess I'll wash up before done here. Mm, Let me get this. Here's mortuary. Yeah. Never good news this time of night. Yeah. Yes, no problem. Good night. So, uh, apparently another body is en route from the hospital accident victim. Should be here any minute. Busy night. Yes, indeed. Anyway, they want her prepared as soon as possible, so I'm going to stick around. Um, why don't you just head home, Tori? I, I can take care of things. Really? I, I mean, I'll be glad to stay. No. No, you've, you've had a full day. You should, um... Uh, must be them now. <laughs> I have no life anyway. I should just stay. What do you think, Mr. Roberts? <laughs> they always say you start talking to corpses eventually. Here we go. Right here, gentlemen. Uh, is that on the table? One, two, three. Yeah. Seems intact. All her limbs. Don't know what kind of, uh, shape she's in. I didn't see her before she went in the bag. Uh, Can you sign here, ma'am? Sure, what happened? A young 20-something out partying early for Halloween, the way I hear it. Ran out in front of a car and... Smack! Dead on the scene. Mm. Pity. Um, Her belongings are in the package here. Jewelry and such. Uh, Well, we gotta be going. Got another delivery for Kaiser's home on the other side of town. Have a good night, gentlemen. Is her family coming? Mm. Not tonight. They were understandably distraught. The mother was inconsolable, I hear. Accident victims are always the worst. Well, brace yourself. This isn't likely to be pretty. Hmm. Remarkable. I've never seen one like this before. It's almost like... Well, as if she... As if she were sleeping... Yes, with the exception of some minor bruising, this one's in fine shape. Shouldn't be nearly as much cosmetic work as I feared. Rigor hasn't even set in yet. They'll probably be able to perform an open casket service if requested. I presume they won't bury her in the naughty nurse outfit, though. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Serena McBride, age 24, Caucasian female, cause of death. She looks Blunt so peaceful. Trauma, pronounced dead at 740. <gasps> oh, Christ, did you see that? What is it? God, my heart's racing. What did you see? I could swear. I just saw her eyelid flutter. Did, did her eyes open? No, no, it was just for a second. <sighs> Nothing to be alarmed about. Um, just a muscular thing. I've seen it many times. The brain is dead, the heart is stopped, but parts of the body are still dying, moving their last. I'm sorry, I, I, I know I shouldn't have reacted like that. No, no harm done. The human body can display some odd behavior in its final hours. Mr. Sadler, why don't you just go home? I I can take it from here. Well, I'm not so sure you're ready to, um, you see, uh, (laughs) who am I fooling? Of course you're ready. You did a wonderful job on Mr. Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Sadler. You sure you feel up to it? It's been a long day. Shouldn't take much time. I'll document everything on the mini recorder and you can review it tomorrow. All right. 
Just follow your procedures and there should be no problem. Let's see. Where's my coat? Ah, here we go. Good night, Mr. Sadler. Don't hesitate to call if you need anything. Uh, you have my cell. I do. I'll see you tomorrow. Well, I suppose I might as well get this show on the road. It is now 1 a.m. October 31st. I've examined the body of the deceased, Serena McBride, for vital signs. Rigor mortis has oddly not occurred yet, but I can detect no pulse or respiration. I've just bathed the body with a disinfectant and am now preparing to set the features before embalming. The eyes and mouth have remained closed, but I'm going to use a needle injector to ensure the jaw doesn't spring open at some point. It's just unnerving. Her eyelid is fluttering again, and I don't understand why she would... What the hell? Her body is tensing. Some irregular spasms. Oh, God. Oh, my God. Oh, God. This can't be. Oh, Jesus. Slave. <laughs> Where am I? What are you doing to this me? This is unbelievable. This is just... Relax. <laughs> Calm down. What happened? Where are my clothes, for God's sake? You don't remember? I'm cold. Stay I'm sorry. Me. Here, put this over you. Did somebody slip something in my drink? Son of a bitch, Jack slipped something in my drink, didn't he? This is insane. You're damn right it is. I need to call a cab. I can't drive home like this. Just calm down. I, I, I can't believe I was just about to... Just about to what? Where am I? Why are you dressed like that? That rubber apron and... Oh. What kind of costume is that? It's not a costume, I'm afraid. What happened to me? Tell me what happened. Watch your step. Here, sit down. Oh, I hate all over. Hangover sucks. So you don't remember anything? I was at the party and <laughs> drinking way too much. You guys keep it kind of cold in here. Can I get you some coffee? Just brewed a fresh pot. Sure. Got anything for a headache? Yeah. I'll bring you a Tylenol. Just a second. What kind of hospital is this? Uh, it's not a hospital. Garrett's Mortuary. Hi there, Tori. I thought I would give you a quick call before I turned in and see how things were going. Mr. Sadler, I don't know how to tell you this, but that girl we brought in, the accident victim, well, she's alive. Dear Lord, alive? Are you sure? She's sitting in the next room right now. Extraordinary. Uh, what about you? Are you all right? My nerves are shot, but other than that, I'm, yeah. Have you called the hospital yet? No, I haven't had time. She just woke up on the table a few minutes ago. I was about to when... Listen to me. Don't do anything until I get there, Tori. She probably needs medical attention. Are you sure? Just keep her there. Keep her comfortable. I'll be along shortly. Okay, but... But what if she... Hey, come here! Just a second! Here you go. This ought to warm you up. Thanks. Tell me something, miss. I'm Tori. Tori. Who's in the other room? Huh? The other room that I woke up in. I keep hearing a voice in there. There's just you and me here. It's a man's voice. It keeps asking me something. I don't hear anything. Are you sure we're alone here? Listen, Serena, you've been through quite an ordeal. You've had a head injury and, at the very least, a concussion. What's in that room? I don't think you need to be moving around too much. I was a little dizzy before, but I'm okay. There was somebody in there earlier. I saw them. Someone covered. Oh, Mr. Roberts. Trust me, he's in no condition to speak. This is a morgue, isn't it? It is. I, I didn't want to tell you, but... 
So am I alive or dead? You're very much alive. But I was dead. Well, your vital signs were almost non-existent. For all practical matters, you were clinically deceased. Oh my god. What's wrong? I thought that what happened, that place, I, I just figured it was all a nightmare. Sit down. It was real? Oh my god, it was all real! Please sit down. Just tell me what you're talking about. I remember it all now. What do you remember? There's nothing, Tori. Absolutely nothing. What are you talking about? There's nothing on the other side. It's all coming back to me now. You had some sort of out-of-body experience? The dead walk this world, Tori. There's nothing else. Lost souls wandering aimlessly. Some not even realizing they're dead. No heaven, no hell. Is that what you believe? It doesn't matter what I believe, it's reality. Listen to me, the afterlife is just a shadow of this world. A mist-shrouded purgatory like some big dumping ground for souls. Everyone that just passed, looking for something. A place. What are they looking for? Something called the Twilight Road. The Twilight Road? What is that? I don't know, but maybe that's the big damn cosmic irony of it all. They're all seeking something that they can never find because it doesn't exist. Don't you hear them? Serena, I think you need to lie down. Uh, have a seat on the couch. Here, come on. You're still in shock. You need to take it easy. How many people are kept here? Don't worry about that. I need to know. How many corpses are here? I'm not sure. Maybe five or six in storage down in the basement? One in the prep room? I can't stay here. You're in no condition to leave. You don't understand. They're calling me. They know that I came back and they won't stand for it. Serena, that's just nonsense. All of this is just some delusion your mind has concocted. You were involved in a very serious accident and you're not thinking straight. I want to believe you, but there's just too many voices here calling me. Shh, calm down. Everything's going to be all right. Everything will be all right. Serena. 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 Did Mr. Sadler, thank God. I got here as quickly as I could. She's resting. Very unstable, though. Where is she? She was just lying on the couch. Serena? Serena? I'll check the hallway and the lab, see if she's in the prep room. Serena! 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 Serena, where are you? I can't stay here! What did you do to Mr. Robert's body? He wouldn't stop talking. I just tried to make him stop. Honey, he's dead. Carving him don't up. Don't you think I know that? Serena, please, put away the scalpel. Let Tori, us Tori, don't away. try to stop me. There's too many voices here. Too many dead souls. I have to leave now. Serena, you're very sick. They're trying to pull me back, don't you see? They think that I know where it is, but I don't. I've never been there. I've never even heard of it. This Twilight Road? Yes. Stay away from me, Tori! Put down the scalpel. Don't come any closer! I'm warning you! I've got her! Ah! Ah! I can't... Stay still! What are you doing? Uh, just a little chloroform from the lab. Fortunately, she didn't spot me creeping up behind her. That scalpel could have taken my head off. Help me move her to the couch. Is she okay? Uh, just... Just unconscious. We should call the hospital. Already have. EMTs will be along any minute now. She was so convinced she heard voices. Poor girl. Hopefully there's no serious damage. Tori, 
You perform well above and beyond the call of duty. Why don't you go home? Get some rest. Mr. Sadler, I, I don't... Tori, I... I insist. I can handle things from here. Besides, I need to fill out some paperwork. Make the appropriate phone calls. Make sure there's no looming litigation over this debacle. Okay. Okay, you're right. I'll, I'll grab my things and go. It, it has been a long night. Where... where am I? Relax, dear. Just relax. I'm about to give you something in this syringe that'll make this much easier for you. You'll feel a brief prick. Ah. There you go. What are you... Why am I back on this table? It's for your own good, Serena. Trust me. You've had a window to a world few live to tell of. Doesn't happen often, thankfully. In fact, in my 25 years in this field, I've had it happen only once before. What are you doing? A young man woke up on my table once very early in my career. He was only 12. <laughs> fell through the ice at the lake. Was dead for hours and nearly gave me a heart attack when he opened his eyes. I had just begun to glue them shut. I feel weird. Anyway, is this... Uh, young man began to recover, he had much the same story to tell as you. I need to leave this place. The voices are calling, and I have to go. Of course they do. They think you know where it is. That road they search for, what do they call it? Twilight... Twilight? Yes, the Twilight Road. The dead always believe the new arrivals had the answer. They never do. Twilight Road. Needless to say, I was overjoyed this boy was alive, but sadly, he couldn't shake the voices. They followed him everywhere. They say he still hears them through the Thorazine. Last I knew, he was institutionalized at Briarwood, a violent schizophrenic. I was young back then, inexperienced. Didn't understand the repercussions, didn't know the unspoken rule among many of us in this profession. After all, it would have been more humane for the poor boy if I had just finished the job that day all those years ago. <coughs> Living with that regret has been difficult. The voices will haunt you as long as you live, Serena, just as they did that boy. They will drive you mad. What I'm about to do may seem cruel, but in fact it is a... The back entrance. Now, who the devil could that be? <coughs> Serena. Serena, wake up. Come on, before he comes back. I need you to help me so I can get you out of here. Come on, on your feet. Uh, Atta girl, put your arm over my shoulder. Easy. One step at a time. I am so dizzy. It's okay. You want it out of here, right? Away from the voices? That's what we're going to do, honey. Let's pick up our feet. Good. We don't have much time. Here's the car. Easy. Easy. Sure is foggy out here. Watch your head. There you go. Where do you think you're going? <gasps> uh, taking this girl to the hospital. She needs medical attention. Then I'm going to the police. I've already called the police, Tori. Are you sure you know what you're doing? Don't try to stop me. You were going to kill her! It is an unfortunate necessity. Are you kidding me? This is just insane! She doesn't see dead people. She's suffering delusions. Come to think of it, you're pretty damn delusional yourself. Ah! Oh my god, they're everywhere! Oh my god, Serena, come back! This world is a morgue, Tori. The souls of the dead don't crumble into the ground like their corpses. They linger here forever. Our world is a very haunted place. Serena! She'll never escape them. <laughs> Serena, thank God. What's wrong? I'm not going to let Sadler hurt you. The voices, they're worse than before. All around me, my mind is crowded with them. The smell of rot, the decay of their breath on my neck. I don't know! I don't know where it is! Serena, you're very sick. I wish 
that was all it was. I do. I really feel neat. Serena? Serena? <laughs> Thank God. Stay right where you are, miss. Keep your hands where we can see them. Please. We have to get this woman to a hospital. Step away from her, ma'am. Just stand on the curb there. You're not hiding any concealed weapons, are you? No, no, of course not. What's your name, miss? Tori. Tori Howard. Can I see your ID? Well, I left it in my car back at the funeral home. I, uh, listen, you need to call an ambulance. This woman needs help. Jim, check her out. Sure. This is Unit 9 responding to call from Garrett's Mortuary. Request EMTs be dispatched to corner of 2211 Matheson Drive. We have a Caucasian female unresponsive on the sidewalk. Copy that, Unit 9. EMTs are on the way. Oh, thank heavens. You caught her. Well, we were in the neighborhood, Mr. Sadler. Just got the call. Officer! Uh, Mr. Sadler was in the process of trying to embalm this woman! Hey, Schubert. Better call the coroner. This girl is dead. No! That can't be! I mean, I mean, she was just... Of course, I was trying to embalm her. That is my job. Ma'am, I need you to put your hands on the car. No, you don't understand. Uh, this son of a bitch injected her with something earlier. I was just talking with her. Ma'am? I can administer CPR. I'll try to revive her. Tori, she's been dead for hours. You lying bastard! Hands on the car, ma'am. No, I have the paperwork right here. We received the body around midnight. Serena McBride. She was pronounced dead at the scene. Accident victim? Yes, Hey, Schubert, she's the lady that got hit by the car near Alpine Crossing. You know, we worked traffic on that one earlier. They carted her off covered with a sheet, dead on the scene, just like he said. Yeah, yeah, I remember. What exactly were you doing with her body, miss? You don't understand. She woke up on the table. She was alive. Officer, Miss Howard has been under enormous stress lately. Long hours, it's a, um, it's a grisly business. I, I fear she may have suffered a bit of a breakdown. You lying cat! Whoa, 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 hey, here. take it easy. Take it easy, ma'am. What did ma you intend to Calm down, down ma'am. She was alive! Stop struggling! I hate to do this. Just zap her, Jim. <laughs> Slap the cuffs on her. Let's get this feisty young lady into the car. You got her, Jim? Yep. Yeah. This is Unit 9. Uh, cancel that call for the EMTs. We already got a meat wagon here. Copy that, Unit 9. Here, let me help you load that body into the van, Mr. Sadler. Um, yes, thank you, officer. <clears throat> you see her eyes flutter? <clears throat> Muscular impulses, officer. The tissue is still dying, you see. <clears throat> hmm. Definitely no pulse on this one. Ah, there we go. Now, officer, if you will excuse me, there's still much to be done. Unit 9 in transit, we have a Caucasian female, uh, Tori Howard, an employee from Garrett's Mortuary, seems uh, to have suffered some type of mental episode. She is... Uh, highly agitated and we were forced to utilize a, a taser in subduing her. Uh, appears that she was attempting to uh, abduct a body from the morgue. Copy that Unit 9. I'm being told you need to transport her to the Briarwood facility for evaluation. The nut house? Uh, affirmative. The voice recorder. I have proof. What'd she say? Something about a voice recorder? I swear, it's all on the recorder. She... She woke up on the table. It was in my pocket. Uh, there's nothing in your pocket, ma'am. I checked before we put you in the car. Must have fallen out back there. Somewhere. She was... She was alive. I swear. Relax, ma'am. We'll get it sorted out. Now, let's see. Briarwood's out near Beaumont Park. I think I'll take the interstate. No, it's it's quicker if you take Twilight. Twilight? Yeah, old Twilight Road. It'll uh, take us straight there. Twilight? 
Twilight Road? See, she's heard of it. All right. Twilight it is then. Twilight Road. You've been listening to Campfire Radio Theater. Tonight's tale, Twilight Road, was written, directed, and produced by John Ballantyne. Featured in the cast were Diane Gilbert as Tori, Shelby Sessler as Serena, John Ballantyne as Sadler, Blaine Hicklin as Officer Schubert, also featured were Alex Pinnock, Teresa Ballantyne, and Jason Haney. Music by Kevin McLeod, Richard Lanehart, Tom Cusack, Ambient Fabric, and Still Water. Sound design by Tim Holding and John Ballantyne. Additional sound provided by Free Sound Project. Mixing and post-production by John Ballantyne. Visit us at campfireradiotheater.podbean.com and on Facebook at Campfire Radio Theater. Welcome, friend. Have a seat by the fire. Make yourself comfortable. The children slumbered as dawn crept over a frozen plain, their kind fast asleep, adrift in a shadowland of dreams, monstrous dreams. You're listening to Campfire Radio Theater. Tonight's tale written by John Ballantyne takes us to a remote Romanian village toward the end of World War II, a place where townsfolk speak in hushed whispers even now in regard to the master's hungry children. We've scattered the village, Colonel. The area is secure. We'll have no problems with Russian snipers here. What about the rock chest there? Off into meadow. It's a poor line of sight. My men assure me it's abandoned, though. I doubt there's a structure here tall enough to make an effective sniper's nest. Good work, Lieutenant Eichel. Open here to hold a rifle unless these livestock have evolved the dexterity. <laughs> Not a living soul in the street. Nothing but animals. I suppose they cower in their homes, sad little peasants. <laughs> Attention citizens of whatever you call this dirt clod of a town, I am Colonel Victor Kruger of the German army. We are in need of supplies and shelter. Maybe no one is here, Colonel. Oh, they're here. Hiding behind closed doors and cellars. They want us to leave, Lieutenant, but that's simply not going to happen. Such a shame to spend the long winter without a calf or sow to butcher. I give you a count to five to step out and show yourself before I begin slaughtering your food supply in the street. One, two, three, four. Please, I beg you, sir. Hold your fire! Please, don't shoot. <laughs> Calm down. Calm down. You needn't be alarmed. I beg you, sirs. You mustn't kill the animals. For our sake. For all our sakes. Catch your breath, sir, and, and tell me your name. My name. 
to Abramovitz. So, it is but you left, and the women and children. Is that the case? By and large. With the exception of the older men and the, the crippled. Ah, I see. Uh, you are of Jewish descent. Yes. What the devil are you doing here? There are places for your kind. They saw fit to leave me here. With all the able-bodied men off at war. You see, I am caretaker of this village. As a caretaker? I tend the livestock just as I've done since boyhood. I tend them for the, for the master. Your master? I thought there were none left here but old men and women. The master is old. Quite old. Uh, you don't know of him? <laughs> Our master resides in Berlin, and he is most demanding. I could tell the men to stand down. We're in no danger here. Yes, sir. Have them stow their gear. They'll be staying here for the evening. All right, put away your equipment. Now, let's see. We've been traveling for days through this wretched countryside. Uh, these men are tired and in dire need of rest. I need you to make accommodations for them. As that means comfortable beds. I don't care who must give up theirs. Is that understood? I will do my best to see to that. And perhaps you should honor us with a dinner tonight. A dinner? Of course! Yes, we have grain and corn and uh, potatoes and turnips uh, stored for the winter all back in the uh, granaries. <laughs> oh, you're joking. We're a traveling army, dear man. We need meat fresh meat. That pig will do nicely, and I'd prefer a rack of lamb as well. Why, yes, there's plenty here for all. Eichel. Eichel! Yes, sir? See to it, those two animals are butchered properly. Butcher them? No, no, that's that's not wise. That's not wise at all. We'll roast that pig on a spit over there. Collect some wood for a fire. This is a serious matter if you wish to, to take livestock from the herd. I'd like to be sitting at a table before the bitter night falls on this place. Perhaps if you're well behaved, I'll allow you to dine with us. <laughs> you're good, sir. Take your seat there, Eichel. What kept you? Trying to ring up our forces near Nussdorf, but haven't been able to establish contact. Good, sir. Communication lines uh, will be spotty in these hills. Your food, sir? Yes, thank you. Very nice, my little plum. Now off with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, these peasants have the appeal, eh, Eichel? Reminds me of that village near the border, you recall? <laughs> A man must take pleasures where he must in this war. <laughs> I suppose so, sir. So, uh, what's bothering you, Eichel? Colonel, uh, this place is not on any of our maps. We've gone through uncharted towns before? True, sir. I guess the talk among the men has me on edge. The talk among the men? They claim to hear whispers on the night wind. And you're certain this area is secure from enemy troop movements? As certain as I can be, sir. The Russian infantry are a good three or four days behind us. It's likely nothing more than tricks of the wind, whistling over an open countryside. I, I must agree. But they also speak of shadows that move, that appear to lurk in the darkness just out of reach. Some say they feel eyes upon them. So talk has turned to witches and goblins. Do you think, sir, sometimes, sometimes I wonder, do you think, sir, that we will have to pay for the things that we've done in this war? Pay? To who? Some higher power? God, perhaps? <laughs> Dear Eichel, oh, there's no God. Some commotion outside, sir. All right, move aside. Step aside. Clear the air for the colonel. Abramowitz. Abramowitz, what's the meaning of this? It is two of your men, colonel. Yes, what of them? Something terrible has happened. Well, spit it out. They're over there in the alleyway. Do oh, for Christ's sakes, go check on them, Eichel. Yes, sir. If there's been some mischief on their part, well, 
These men have not seen the fairer sex in some time, and they have natural urges to contend. Kruger! Yes? Come, sir, come quickly! Oh, this better be worth my dinner turning cold. Come along, Abramowitz, and see what perversions have been wrought. Oh, these men can be incorrigible, given a taste of freedom. Such time spent on the front, their minds filled with... Is that blood? In the snow there? Sir, it's Brosau and Hefner. Is someone injured? There's a great deal of blood for them. Oh. They were found here. Like this. Mm, this is fresh. Their throat snarled wide open. There's gore spread everywhere. Look at Brosau. It's as if something reached down in his throat and tore out his beating heart. Took a bite of it like a ripe red apple. There is a vicious nature to this. Abramowitz! Sir, this seems more of an animal attack of some sort. I suppose one of the goats did this. Don't be ridiculous. There is no evidence of struggle. Their guns weren't even discharged. I suspect one of these homely harlots distracted the men while another slipped behind them and slit their throats. But there are bite marks about their necks. Colonel, please. I plead of you, for your own safety and that of your men, Please, leave this place. Leave, and never, ever return. Is that some thinly veiled threat? I could level this village, burn it to the ground. Don't think for a moment I've not done worse. No, no, please. I, I, I intend neither to threaten nor insult you, Colonel. Very well. So who shall I begin with, hmm? Perhaps the old woman? Hunched over near that well? All the young girl clinging to her mother's apron there in the crowd. She can be no more than five, wouldn't you say? Well, who? God in heaven, what do you mean, Colonel? Before the murderer among you steps forward, how many of you must I kill? How many? There, There is no one here capable of such. Then why the hell are two of my men dead? Perhaps I should just shoot you. That may cut to the meat of this matter. What a look! What is it, Eichel? Towards that rock church in the distance. Looks to the graveyard. A dark figure moves among the headstones. Yes, I see it. And it walks upright. Not likely any beast other than the one known as man. It disappeared into the church. There's candlelight glowing within. I thought this rock church was abandoned. It was, sir. Lieutenant put together a well-armed party and sends him out to the church. No! That is the master's house. You must not intrude on him. Move aside! No, you don't understand. The master is not to be disturbed. There... Achtung. There is a covenant. Out of my way. Stupid peasant! <laughs> Except for one man seated at a long table. And what does he have to say for himself? Not much. He wishes to speak with you. No use to keep him waiting then. Sir, um, I have our best men posted in the sanctuary. They are well armed, and you should be safe, but. But? I wouldn't get too close to him. There's something. There's something sinister to him. In his eyes, in his bearing, he doesn't seem the least bit concerned that we're here. He may change his attitude after our talk. Colonel, I see what the men were speaking of now. I could swear I saw them too. So what, Eichel? The shadows in the sanctuary. They seem to move. Look around you with conscious thought. With a mind of their own. Tricks of the candlelight. You're spooking yourself. Uh, of course, you're right, sir. At ease, Corporal. He awaits you just ahead in the next chamber, sir. Do 
You must be Colonel Kruger. And you? Findrel is my name. Have a seat at my table. I think not. As you wish. What brings you into this chilled night, Colonel? You know damn well. Two of my soldiers lay dead back there in that village. That is regrettable. Regrettable? Is that all you have to say? What more need be said over the dead? Explain to me how I'm supposed to bury the bodies into this godless ground, or how they ended up in this state in the first place, their heads nearly severed from their torsos. Might you be acquainted with the responsible party? You think that I killed your men? Despite your clever disguise as a man of the cloth, yes, I do suspect it was you. I fear you presume incorrectly. These robes are not those of a priest nor holy man. And I am no man of God. So, you live here, in this old church. Is that so? It is my home. There was a thorough inspection of this medieval structure earlier today when we arrived. There was not a soul here. During the daylight, I am at rest. Curious hours. Not for one such as myself, Colonel. Is your interrogation at an end? You try my patience, Fendrel. Tell me what you know. You and I are alike in many respects, Colonel. We both have witnessed horrors unspeakable, committed sins unforgivable, yet you have your men, your children to look after as I do mine. They can be unruly, not always willing to do your bidding. You're trying to say uh, the villagers did this? No, they are not my children. You see, Colonel, I suffer from a disease which is rare, has no cure. It is spread by blood. I was quarantined here many moons ago. I have over time spread it to others, mostly townspeople from the community below. Those that have been infected are the ones I refer to as my children. The villagers merely serve a purpose. And what purpose might that be? Food. They are cattle. Bread for our consumption. What kind of madness is this? I will not be a gullible participant in your local folklore. If one of your children is responsible for this bloody crime, then hand him over! <laughs> That would not be wise. And why not? Because I'm the only thing keeping you safe from them now, Colonel. Those infected with this disorder take on abilities which are abnormal. The life's blood flowing through you, such a sweet elixir. We crave it incessantly. Besides, it was you and your men that came here and broke our covenant with the village below. Covenant? You speak in riddles. There is a contract that has stood many years, broken this very night. Yes, Althalus, I will show him now. It is written here, right here. Who are you speaking to, you doddering fool? Althalus, the eldest of the children. I see no one. They dance among the shadows most evenings, rarely assuming corporeal form. Ah, yes. Here we are. When you slaughtered livestock this eve for your feast, you in effect forfeited the lives of your two men. What are you talking about? There must be equal compensation for the butchering of livestock. You killed a fatted sow and a lamb for your meal, did you not? What of it? Althalos took the lives of your two soldiers for his meal, an equal compensation. Don't come any closer. Our covenant with the villagers provides for their safety from our bloodlust as long as there's a herd to feed from. My servant Abramowitz tends that herd, so that his people might not again become our prey. Granted, goat's blood is not as pleasurable to feed upon as that of mortal men, but we have adapted. Perhaps you will adapt as well. 
adapt from what? I don't pretend to be any blood-sucking ghoul as you do. Adapt from your own manner of bloodlust. If you are to live in this world, Kurt. You presume to lecture me, you insolent fool? What would stop me from leveling this church to its foundation? <laughs> Colonel, I could smite you where you stand before you draw another breath or clear that gun from your holster. You're surrounded, Fendral. <laughs> I offer you a hospitality. We kill for sustenance, not sport. Be on your way, and I spare you and your men. You seek I won't return? With more men? More guns? I've seen many wars, Colonel. Enough to know this war is over for you and your countrymen. The Germans are far too occupied in retreat from the Russians to be bothered with such a trifle, a speck of a village on the outskirts of nowhere. In a few months' time, you'll all be either prisoners of war or rotting away in some shallow grave. No, a clever bluff. But let's not deceive ourselves. There will be no reinforcements. You spoke with him? Never mind that. Informs the men to have their equipment packed immediately. We will be departing as soon as possible. Before daylight, sir? That is my order, Lieutenant. See to it that it is carried out. Yes, sir. Uh, will we be following the standard practice before we leave, sir? Standard practice? Yes, we will, Michael. Yes, we will. Colonel, you and your lieutenant have returned. What of the Covenant? Did the Master speak of it? Is it... Is it still in effect? All is well with your covenant, dear fellow, but oh. there will soon be much what? more pressing problems. Eichel! Yes, Colonel? Uh, take care of the matter we discussed. Yes, sir. And um, Bramowitz, things are about to change for you and your people. I don't understand, Colonel. Oh. I, I, I thought all was well with the master. Uh, forget this Vindral that lives in your rock church. He's quite the delusional lunatic, but perfectly harmless. He is... He is far from harmless, I assure you, Colonel. It's going to be a very trying winter for you and your uh, fellow villagers. Uh, we will leave enough food stores for you to sustain yourself for a short period. What in heaven's name do you mean, Colonel? There is a massive Russian Red Army mere days behind us. We can leave nothing that they might find useful here. Your livestock, your food reserves, uh, they must be destroyed. This is what we do. It is our orders to burn and pillage. Leave nothing behind for an enemy to make use of. My herds, my, my animals, you must stop them! No, you don't understand! Our lives depend on them! Of course you should abandon the weak, the sick immediately. They will not live out the harsh winter. Only the very strong will survive. You sentence us all to death! Consider yourself fortunate, Abramowitz. I thought... I thought there could be no darker man than the master. But you, Colonel, you are inhuman, devious. Watch yourself, Abramowitz. I could just as easily end it here for you now. Mm. But what of yourself, Colonel? You think the master will allow you to leave this place after what you've done here? You are all deranged. He has no power over you. Oh, I told them not to waste bullets on the townsfolk. There is no food now for any of us. No food for the master and his children either. Except us and you, Colonel. You and your men. What is going on up there? Sir, we are under attack. Under attack by what? It's the shadows, sir. They spring from the darkness like birds of prey. Hovering over that soldier. 
pale and withered like some. For God's sake, shoot it before it rips out his jugular! It's gone! Disappeared into the shadows! Good God! The blood! More of them! We're surrounded! What? What is that? The voice is on the wind colonel. Oh, what have we done? What have we done? Ah! 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 Help me! He's killing at me! Help me! Oh, God. Oh, God. Shoot it! Shoot it! What in all that's holy? Shoot it! Oh! 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 Thank God. Bless you, Abramowitz. Those creatures out there, unholy abominations, all my men are dead. You brought this upon us, Colonel. We must survive until daylight. I can walk to the next town. Seek us help. The air is frozen even in the middle of the day. The nearest village is too far, and they will not come to this place. They know of the things that dwell here. Ambramowitz, I would have a word with you. Oh, dear God. Is there some place I might hide? <sighs> Under the floor. There's a loose plank. It'll be a tight fit, but others have hid here. Abramowitz, I, I am forever in your debt. Abramowitz, where are your manners? I am coming, uh, Master. Uh, Have you any food? God in heaven, it's you. The peasant girl. The one who served us. I'm hungry. So hungry. Quiet. For Our book that sinks. Your herd has been decimated. Yes, I know. But what are you doing? My plum, you're too close. So hungry, so thirsty. They equips their thirst in Nazi blood this night, but it will not last. Soon they must be again, and their appetite is voracious. They are very no, Stay awake. In danger when the bloodlust takes hold. Oh, why not go into the countryside? You're too close. There are other villages, other farms, whole oh, armies marching across this land. Why must we be cursed? You know, we can adventure far, but we dare not enter into daylight. This is our home as it is yours. So which of your people shall be my first meal? That is, if you have no wish to turn the good Colonel Kruger over to me. Dear, Colonel Kruger? Release me. Uh, let go of my arm. I must drink. So thirsty. I smell him here. The mortal blood flowing. What the fuck are you doing? No, that that head. Stop your biting into my arm. Let go, you stupid slut. Ah! What have we here? Look what I've discovered under your floorboard, a Nazi rat. And look at your arm, Colonel. You've been infected uh, by this girl. She's not like you. She's but a simple peasant. The affliction hasn't taken hold yet, but I assure you, she is one of us. Much as you are now, Colonel. What? Unhand me. Unhand me, you demon! As you wish. Ah! Uh, uh. She... she barely broke the skin. I'll be all right. Blood flows down your Uh, arm, Colonel. You are infected. Shall I finish you? What? Remove the life's blood from your body. That way you needn't fear becoming one of us. 
Or perhaps we needn't fear the same. No, stay away from me. Stay away! You monsters! All of you! All of you! Blood-sucking monsters! <laughs> Such an amusingly ironic man. Monsters! Her name was Tarsiana. She was my niece. I will finish what was started before the infection transforms her. Rest assured, I need no more of these unruly children to keep fed. And I know you wish her not to become a member of our brood. Death is mercy. Thank you, Master. But what of the Colonel? Oh, Colonel Kruger will not make it far. Look to the horizon, my old friend. It glows. Daybreak is but a strike of the clock away. There in the open field he will have no protection, no cover. Soon he will find the sunlight his enemy. I suspect by noon you will locate the colonel's bleached bones smoldering in the snow. I suppose I will bury him when the ground thaws, if I survive this winter. There will be unwary souls through here in the coming months, Russians from the east, refugees from the south. There may be ripe pickings for my kind yet. Perhaps we needn't feed on your people so heavily as I feared. But by all means bury the good Colonel, and as a warning to any who might tread his twisted path, carve into his epitaph. Here lies but a paler shade of sinister. You've been listening to Campfire Radio Theatre. Tonight's tale, The Master's Hungry Children, was written, directed, and produced by John Ballantyne. Featured in the cast were John Ballantyne as Colonel Kruger and Fendrel, Blaine Hicklin as Abramowitz, Dennis Kasher as Lieutenant Eichel, Tanya Malovic as... Daciana. Also featured were Glenn Haskell and Alex Pinnock. Music by Kevin MacLeod. The piece Mournful Strings by Hammer Clavier. Sound design by Tim Holding and John Ballantyne. Additional sound provided by Free Sound Project. Mixing and post production by John Ballantyne. Visit us at campfireradiotheatre.podbean.com and on Facebook at Campfire Radio Theatre. Organized crime has muscled its way into the world of audio drama. Decorated Air Theatre presents This Thing of Ours, a story of life in the mafia. Follow Carmine Zettarelli. The only reason you're still standing here and not face down in a pool of your own blood is that you're connected to Frank. As he navigates the treacherous New York City underworld, join the family at DecoratedAir.com. 